Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Uh, we're going to take a look today at what the top 50 apps do within app purchasing that helps make them successful that, strangely enough, the rest of us don't do. And we're going to take a look at uh, two different pivots of this data. First, I want to, first I want to make sure that my clicker is on, because that always helps. First, I want to make sure we take a look at how the top 50 did. This is going to be a take a look at the numbers. Uh, how many downloads did they get? How many installs did they get? What did the people do when they got it? It's very quantified uh, data. Then when we have how they did, we want to take a look at what they did differently to get those results. We'll look at that in two pivots, what they did to get those selling results and what they did to get those engagement results. And this will really help us figure out what the top 50 did that the rest of us don't do. All right, I owe you an explanation. Um, I say the rest of us because, quite frankly, my apps are not in the top 50. If you actually have an app that's in the top 50, um, my apologies when I say the rest of us, I don't mean you. And if you have an app that's in the top 50, please feel free to um, pipe in anytime and let us know what the story is. Uh, very happy to hear from the top 50 publishers. Uh, in any case, uh, this is absolutely something that um, uh, we're very interested in because, quite frankly, I love tower defense games. And some of the tower defense games that I think are really at the top of the heap make a lot less money than some of the games that I don't think are quite as good. So we would all kind of like to know what the top 50 are doing that helps get them um, so much success in IAP. Now, at this point, audiences sometimes ask, why does Amazon.com care about the top 50 IAP apps? Well, I owe you an answer on that. And it's because we actually have an Android app store. Our Android app store works on just about any Android device out there. It also works on all the Fire devices, the Fire phone, Fire tablet, Fire TV. It's also the default app store for all BlackBerry 10 devices moving forward. We have customers in 236 countries and territories worldwide. So if we can help all of the developers make a little bit more money with IAP, that's a pretty big deal. And actually, that'll help a whole lot of developers. And if we can make a whole lot of customers happier with their in-app purchase experience, that's a really, really good deal. So as Amazon, the first thing we did was did a cohort analysis. We started gathering data. Now, a cohort analysis is nothing but a fancy way of saying we took 100 downloads for each of the top 50 apps. We took 100 downloads for each of 50 apps that are not in the top, uh, you know, not in the top, but are, are roughly equivalent. And we normalized the data so that we could compare the two data sets against each other. And obviously, on the first day, what happens is 100 people download the top 50 and 100 people download uh, the rest of us. Pretty stable so far. Um, what happens later that day, only about 60% of those apps actually get opened after they're installed. Why is that? Some people may have installed an app because of an offer wall that showed up and they wanted to go ahead and get the free coins pack or uh, other paid acquisition. But it's, it's pretty interesting. Across the board, we see only about 60% of those apps actually get opened after they're downloaded. Now, uh, obviously, if, if that's true, you're going to see uh, some uninstalls again on first day. Uh, you know, you'll look for the big things that are taking up space in your device. You go ahead and uninstall those, particularly if you never open them. So that makes sense. What's really interesting, though, is of those people who downloaded and opened the app, how many actually bought something? Well, in the Amazon App Store, it's about 3%. So when we looked at our data for the top 50 and for everyone else, about 3% of total downloads turned into paying users, um, which is pretty nice. I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's average across all of the app stores. At least that's what uh, my developers are telling me. And this data up here on top, I'll tend to refer to this as retention data. This is pretty, pretty typical, pretty stereotypical retention data. But we wanted to go a little bit deeper than that. We wanted to find out how the people are engaging in our apps after we've gathered the retention data. So we wanted to take a look at how people spend their time in our apps. So we've got th uh, some pie charts here. The first pie chart is average minutes per session. 
top 50 have about seven and a half minutes per session. The rest of us have about seven minutes per session. The second pie chart is the number of sessions per day that users have with an app. Um, a session means you've uh, closed the app and then you reopen it for a subsequent session. The top 50 have about three, the rest of us uh, a little bit less. And then if you do the math and you multiply the average session length by the number of sessions per day, you get total session minutes. And the top 50 have about 22 total session minutes per day. The rest of us have about 18. Keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on how well the top 50 do in getting larger and larger groups of session minutes throughout, uh, throughout the time period we measure. Okay, so we know the retention data. We know kind of how they're spending their time in the app. I'd like to know kind of how they're spending their money in the app. Well, don't worry, we got that. Um, we normalized this on the rest of us. The apps that we looked at had a pretty wide range of dollar value monetization results. And that turns into a really kind of an awkward way to compare things. So what we did was we normalized the revenue of the rest of us to be 100% so we could see at a percentage basis how differently the top 50 are versus the rest of us. And in terms of items that are being sold on day one, the top 50 sell 12% more items than the rest of us do. Not only do they sell 12% more stuff, they sell it at a 36% higher price than the rest of us do. Now, go ahead and do the math on that, and you find out that for average revenue per paying user, the top 50 are making 54% more than the rest of us on day one. Wow, okay, that's actually a pretty big difference. Well, we didn't just measure one day, we measured a bunch of days. So let's take a look at how this data goes on day two. The retention data is, Pretty much, it's pretty much the same. Um, when you take a look at the number of minutes per session, again, those total session minutes are creeping up in favor of the top 50. But the real big change here is in that second bar chart. The top 50 now only have a 7% advantage in price paid per item. Now, this isn't because the top 50 have all of a sudden done something horribly wrong and have completely messed up. Actually, it's because the rest of us are starting to sell a little bit deeper into our IAP catalogs. The rest of us are doing something well. We're starting to show users things that are a little bit more expensive, or we're making the value case for things that are more expensive in our catalog. And that's how we kind of close the gap on that. So the total, there's only a 14% advantage for the top 50 in average revenue per paying user. A day later, we still have statistically equal uh, retention data. The top 50 are still doing well with larger session length, more session count, again, for a larger percentage of that total minutes pie. This becomes relevant as we look at, at how this works and what's going on. Um, and we're starting to see things level out in terms of uh, an increased number of items sold uh, and an increased price per sale. Excuse me. <coughs> and uh, we're starting to see the average revenue uh, start to flatten out so that a week later, we, while we start to see a little bit of statistically significant difference in retention data, uh, we see the same trends in total session minutes, and we see the, roughly the same advantage in average revenue per paying user. Now, when you take a look at two weeks later, that you know 20% difference in retention turns into now a 40% difference in user retention. That's getting to be a pretty big deal. And now again, you see the total session minutes being a really big advantage for the top 50. Uh, and they're staying with their 20% average revenue per paying user advantage. Now, what happens a month later? <laughs> that 40% uh, advantage uh, in retention turns into a 100% advantage in user retention. They're getting way more minutes and they've even increased their total average revenue per paying user advantage by, while well, they're only selling 3% more items than the rest of us, they consistently get more money for every item sold than the rest of us do. Now, I know a lot of you guys have seen the numbers and most of us know uh, through our own experience that after day seven, you've probably lost about 80% of your users. Anyway, is that a pretty common experience? You've lost about 80% of your, your users after day seven. So really, why would it matter 
what kind of retention you get or how many sales you get at two weeks and at one month later. Well, actually it makes a pretty big difference. And I'd like to show you uh, this difference in terms of purchases per hour. So we went ahead and measured not the dollar value of purchases, but the actual purchase events um, by hour since someone installed it. Um, obviously the first 24 hours is a pretty big deal. You get 18% of all of your purchases are going to happen in the first 24 hours. Um, that's, that's great. But this tail goes on forever, well, seemingly forever. I mean, how many people have seen Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, where he gets up on the cherry pricker and draws the climate graph up to the rafters? Well, we could have taken a golf cart and driven this way for about 10 minutes. We could have just kept drawing this line out. Because the people who are left, the 20% of the people or 8% of the people who ultimately stay with your app long term, love your app. They love what you're doing. And as a matter of fact, they love what you're doing so much that after a user has been in your app for 30 days, they're willing to spend a lot more money per item than they were on day zero. In the research that we did for the survey, we found that users who have been with your app for 30 days are likely to spend 60% more on each in-app purchase than they were at day zero. This is a great reason to care about all those users who stay with your apps after day seven. So let's think about what we learned just kind of taking a look at the numbers. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the top 50 uh, sell more items at a higher price. All right, that's not rocket science. I'm sure you guys are thinking, well, Mike, if I could sell more things at a higher price, I'd be in the top 52, right? Okay, um, I'll tell you guys how they did this in a little bit. Uh, the other takeaway I want you to get from this is that the standard user retention data isn't the only data that matters. Minutes per session matters a lot, and the number of sessions per day matters a lot when it comes to in-app purchase effectiveness. And we'll take a look at how the top 50 leverage that uh, going forward. So, what did they do differently to impact those bar charts? What do they do differently to impact selling? Well, the top 50 absolutely know the data that drives sales. They know that they need to give the users a reason to come back into the game because 64% of all the revenue they're going to make is going to come on someone's third or subsequent order. You certainly want to know which users you have that are on their third or later purchase. If you're not doing that with your analytics package now, please start. They also know that 74% of the total revenue they're going to get for their game, they're going to earn from people who are staying with their game over seven days. Yeah, that's right. After 80% of the people have already ditched their game and you've only got 20% left, those 20% are going to provide almost three quarters of their total revenue. As a matter of fact, users who have been with the game 30 days or longer are still going to account for over half of the total revenue that they're going to see from that game. So do you think they're treating their day 30 and longer users the same way that they're treating their day zero users? Mm, they're not. They're actually treating them like gold because that's what they are. Um, think about the games that, that you're making right now and the, and the analytics that you do. Are you treating your day 30 users the same as you treat your day zero users or are you doing something special for them? Well, the, the, top, the top 50 do something special for them. The top 50 also know that 48% of repeat purchases are going to happen within one hour of a previous purchase. Yeah, I know, I just finished showing you a whole bunch of data about what, session length being about seven minutes, 6.9 minutes. So how does a repeat purchase happen within an hour? Well, it doesn't happen within the same session. It happens within a subsequent session. So think about it. How easy is your app to launch and get into? How easy is it to pick up where I left off when I open your app? One of my favorite Connect Four games, it was a fun game to play, but to open the thing you had to launch it and then you get this beautiful splash screen that you have to tap through. Then you have to say new game or saved game, I want a new game. Then you have to pick red or black and you have to reset all of the options that I've already set once, that I've set every time I've played, that I haven't changed since I first started playing the game. I've had to tap like six or seven times now before I start the game and that's really annoying. So annoying that if I'm in line at a store, I'll probably play a different game, like Flappy Birds, or something that I can start playing right away. 
How easy is it for your customers to start a subsequent session in your game? Think about that. Um, there's a lot of activity around whether or not you should try to sell something to someone on the first day or not. Um, regardless of whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, 34 or 37% of the people who will ever buy anything in your game are going to buy something on day one. That means a lot of the people who are going to buy something don't buy something on day one, but will buy something later. So don't ignore people who look like they're going to be players only and not payers. There's a really good chance that those people will become good customers of yours uh, in, in due time. On the other hand, don't ignore the 34%, because those 34%, remember, from purchases, they're going to make up 18% of your total purchases. And the top 50 get this. So what the top 50 do is they make sure they introduce the concept of the in-app purchases in the in-game tutorials. They're not abusive about it. They don't propose it as a pay-to-win kind of scenario. They gently introduce it. And in the data that we looked at from the Amazon App Store, games that had in-app purchasing introduced in their tutorials had a two and a half times better conversion rate than apps that didn't introduce in-app purchasing in their tutorials. Okay. So we've got the users, they've opened the app, we've taught them uh, how to make a purchase, but have we showed them how to use what they've just purchased? Well, the top 50 do. As a matter of fact, when you buy something from the top 50, they'll go ahead and show you how to use that right away. Because if people don't know how to use what they've just purchased, why on earth would they purchase anything else? And again, in our survey, what we found was that games that taught users how to use what they've just purchased saw a 65% increase in repeat orders. That makes a lot of sense when you think about it, doesn't it? If I don't know how to use it, I can't use it up. And if I can't use it up, why would I ever buy more? All right, so where are we now? We've taught users uh, how to get in-app purchase items. We've taught users how to use their in-app purchase items. Um, we need stuff to sell them. So when it comes to selling them things, variety is really, really good. As a matter of fact, the larger the catalog you have, the more average revenue you're, you tend to make, the more sales you're going to tend to make. Now, it's easy to misunderstand this graph and think, boy, you know, I've only got six items. If I just add 10 more, I'll be in the top 50. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't actually work like that. As a matter of fact, the top 50 aren't even showing their entire catalog to the users at once. I mean, we've all seen those really horrible in-app purchase catalogs, the ones where the print is really tiny or it scrolls off the bottom of the screen. I'm not, I'm not, no one had those in the study that we did. Everyone had six to eight items. What the top 50 did, though, was they showed a different six to eight items to customers on day zero, and they showed different items to those same customers on day 30. So they were showing their day 30 customers, you guessed it, stuff that was a little bit more expensive, and they showed their day zero customers. Well, it kind of makes sense, knowing, that, uh, knowing what the data is, doesn't it? So it gives them variety in their catalog so they can show the right item to the right user at the right time. OK, variety is really good when it comes to your catalog. Variety is not so good when it comes to your price points. Um, and it's not that there's one price point that's bad. I mean, $2.99 is not a bad price point, and you should avoid it. $13.99 is not somehow evil. Um, what is bad is having stuff for nine, you know, we're 99 cents, $1.99, $2.99, $3.99, $4.99. I mean, I took economics in college. How many guys took economics in college? A handful of you. Right. So obviously, based on what we were taught in college, if you offer the customers more things, they're more likely to find what they want. Choice is good. If you have a world full of price points, great. You're going to do super well. Except that you confuse the heck out of your customer. <laughs> it's hard to tell what the value is between all of those price points between 99 cents and 4.99. And a confused customer, well, they certainly don't buy the most expensive thing in your catalog. Um, actually, what we found is a confused customer doesn't buy the least expensive thing in your catalog. Confused customer doesn't buy anything from your catalog. So being crystal clear around the value between the price points 
is what the top 50 have really figured out. And too many price points makes it too hard to really clearly delineate the value between what they're offering at those price points. And being clear about value is one of the things the top 50 are really, really good at. Um, this is an example of a good in-app purchasing dialogue. Like I said, we, you, know, you know the bad ones when you see them. So let's take a look at one that's actually okay. I mean, the first, uh, I mean, the column on the left, the one on the top on the right, it's all pretty obviously soft currency stuff. I'm not really sure what the last two things are. They look like they might be hard currency, soft currency bundles or something else. But the price is clear, what you're getting is clear. Um, and I'm talking to a room full of engineers, right? How many guys have done the math and figured out why you'd want to spend $60 instead of $1? How many people have done the math? Yeah, okay, one. Okay, good, good for you on, on, on doing the math. Um, are you really expecting your customers to do the math when they show up to an in-app purchase dialogue? Holy cow, don't make their job any harder than it is. An in-app purchase dialogue that I like better looks more like this, where it's insanely simple for me to figure out why I would want to spend more money than less money. I mean, the benefit to the customer of spending more money is as big and as noticeable as the actual price that they're paying is. Don't make your customer work to give you money. Make it super easy for them to see the value that you're offering them. Um, up at the top, you can see a couple tabs, a gold store and a silver store. Whether or not you're a big fan of tabs is irrelevant, but notice it serves to make a distinction between a soft currency store and a hard currency store. It kind of makes sure that you're always thinking about apples to apples, uh, regardless of whether you're buying soft currency or hard currency items. And that makes things, again, a little less confusing and a little bit easier to compare. So again, they're being super crisp on the value here, and that helps them sell more items for a higher price. All right, what did we learn from this section? We learned that games that had more selection received more orders because they offered the right things to the right people at the right time. And if you show people how to buy stuff and then you show people how to use it, more people will buy stuff and more people will reorder the stuff they use. That's pretty common sense. Also, making sure that your catalog is explicit about the value is really critical and makes a really big difference in your ability to uh, make it easy for your customers to buy things. All right, now let's take a look at what they did differently in order to keep the customer engaged in the game long enough to be exposed to more in-app purchasing opportunities. And the longer they're engaged in the game, the more they like it, the more they're apt to try out new experiences. The first thing is reducing barriers to subsequent sessions. Flappy Birds is great. What, one tap and you're playing the game? OK, that's brilliant. Um, another barrier to frequent usage is in some of the mid-core games or some of the harder core games. Um, again, as a tower defense fanatic, um, I may play on my tablet at home. And I'll get to level 14, uh, put my tablet away. I'm in a line at the grocery store. I pull out my phone. I start playing the tower defense game. And I start at level zero. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to start playing through all those 14 levels again. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open a different app. And they just lost the opportunity to have me start a subsequent session, maybe make a subsequent repeat purchase within an hour, because it was insanely hard for me to get back to where I was. Now, there are lots of tools that will help fix this. Most of the game services out there now offer some sort of a cross-device syncing service. Um, if you don't have a game service that you like already, um, Amazon has game services, Game Circle. We do this sync thing. It's really super simple. There's no reason for you guys not to do this. And it removes a uh, barrier to entry. Uh, that's what the Amazon Game Circle one looks like. Tuning game difficulty is also super important to the top 50. Nobody wants to be the little guy. Really, that's not going to be fun uh, for more than one game. And it's going to be discouraging, and you're not going to want to do it anymore. But even if you're the big guy, how long is that going to be fun? OK, maybe the first two or three times when you feel like Samson, sure. But I mean, then where's the challenge? I mean, you can make mistakes. You could do stupid things. How many of you guys have been playing a game, and then you intentionally do something stupid, and you win anyway, and you think, oh, come on, seriously? Well, yeah. You don't play that game for very long, do you? So they tune the difficulty. One of the things the top 50 do that the rest of us don't do is they know what the right difficulty is. They don't guess at what the right difficulty is. And they know what the right difficulty is because they do A-B testing. Um, more on that later. But make sure that you know you don't guess, because that, that doesn't help much. 
Um, the top 50 also engage with social. The kind of the ante for playing the social game or leaderboards and achievements. And if you don't do this, again, every game service out there um, offers a leaderboards and achievements feature. You should use the one in the game service that you're using. And it can offer stupid, simple benefits. Um, uh, one of my favorite stories is my son and I were playing this geography game, basically pick the uh, capitals of all the countries in the world. And of course, you know, I'm dad, we play the game, I beat him, that's as it should be. Um, later at the office, I get this uh, notification in my system tray that my son has beat my high score. Okay, wait a minute. I travel around the world for a living. This is not okay. So what do I do? I open up the game and I play a couple times until I beat his high score. Um, now everything's as it should be and I can go on with my day. Except I get another notification. You know what? I opened that stupid geography game about 19 times more than I should have. I mean, any one of you guys could have written this game in a weekend. It was that stupid. Uh, of course, I'll never mention the name of the game now that they've called it stupid twice. But anyway, you guys could have written this game yourself. The thing is, they put leaderboards and achievements in, and I couldn't let my son keep the high score, so I saw 19 times as many ads as I should have just because he added leaderboards and achievements to that. What a stupid, simple way of, of getting more sessions uh, for your game. Um, even better if your game is actually really good. Um, so uh, make sure you absolutely do the, the leaderboards and achievements. Um, in addition to doing that, they've figured out that bolting in-app purchasing onto an existing game doesn't really work that well. Um, being a tower defense fan, of course, I've got to show you a tower defense game. How many people are familiar with Bloons Tower Defense? Uh, for yeah, okay, this is a great game by Ninja Kiwi. All these balloons run through the maze. Monkeys have to throw darts at the balloons to stop the balloons from exiting the maze. And if you've got a whole bunch of balloons racing out the end of this maze that you've been working on for 20 minutes, and you want to buy a monkey to destroy all the balloons, you can click on one of those locks, and you can't buy anything. Huh? No, yeah, actually you can't buy anything. You have to exit the level. You have to exit to the start menu, go into a separate menu, a purchasing menu. You have to decide what you want to upgrade, pick the upgrade that you can then buy and use the next time you play the level. Are you serious? Well, if I have to start the level over again anyway, I just might try a few things differently and not buy anything at all. Well, Ninja Kiwi are pretty smart guys and they figured that out. And in the next tower defense game they did, they made sure that the soft currency items are on the left, and the hard currency items you would want to buy are on the right. So instead of balloons and cute little monkeys, I've got hordes of zombies and SAS soldiers. And if a huge horde of zombies is about to infect my civilian population, and I want to get them, I go ahead and I click on the nuclear hand grenade. I know, whoever thought of giving soldiers a nuclear hand grenade, brilliant idea, but it works great in the game, trust me. So I click on that, and they're not just going to sell me one nuclear hand grenade for 99 cents, they're going to sell me three for 99 cents. And then they show me exactly how to use it, by dropping it on the horde of zombies in a drag and drop. It gives me this great countdown, game will start in three, two, one, and then I click on the nuclear hand grenade like it showed me, I drag it over to the, my horde of zombies, boom, big cloud, massive explosion, zombie bits of dust everywhere. It was very satisfying, actually. And my civilian population was safe. And Ninja Kiwi figured out how to sell the right user exactly what I needed, exactly when I wanted it. That was smart. And that's how come they make a lot more money on in-app purchasing on this game than they did when they just bolted it on as an afterthought. Games that make it easy to purchase what you need when you want it earn 75% more than the games in our study that didn't do this. Unfortunately, for the rest of us, most of us tend to bolt in at purchasing on as an afterthought. Um, don't do that. The top 50 also have a lot of levers. To figure out what menu arrangement works, to figure out that you put soft currency on the left and hard currency on the right, they don't guess what to put there. They do A-B testing. They A-B test what catalog items work best for level for, for day 30 users. They A-B test which catalog items work best for day zero users. Um, 
last time I looked, there were about 19 A-B testing services out there. Optimizely has one. Um, Appalytics, I believe, uh, has one. Um, of course, Amazon has an A-B testing API. And they're insanely easy to use. In about 12 lines of code, you can A-B test uh, all kinds of different text on buttons. Um, and it's actually, you can actually change them while your game is out in the wild and you don't have to recompile or redistribute any code. And it's kind of fun trying different button text in your games uh, in the wild and seeing what the difference is. Um, you should really check this out and try it. You'll get some amazing results and you'll be able to know instead of guess what the right thing is for your games. All right, so what did we learn from this? That if you really want to increase the number of sessions and the count of sessions, tweak your game difficulty and add social. And make sure that you customize your in-app purchase catalogs and cater to your best customers, making it super easy uh, for them to identify the value of what they need when they need it. And my gosh, use A-B testing to figure out what the right mix is. Now, I know this has been a lot of data to dump on you guys in just a little over 30 minutes. So if you're only going to do one thing to be like the top 50, show the right users the right item at the right time. Don't show your day 30 user the same in-app purchase catalog you showed them at day zero. Show them something different, more unique. Show them something with more expensive items in it. Oh, and if you're going to do two things, be super clear about the value of each of your in-app purchase items so I know why I should get the blue armor instead of the gold armor. It's better against this kind of weapon or it has this much better defense value. Be super clear about the value in your items and you'll end up doing really well. So if you would like a copy of the slides from this presentation and some of my commentary to go with it, go up to bit.ly top 50 IAP. Um, if you're interested in um, uh, letting me know uh, how you like this presentation, and if you would like to see more presentations like this from Amazon, uh, please fill out the survey at bit.ly top 50 IAP survey, all lowercase. Um, follow me at uh, Mike F. Hines and we can kind of continue the conversation. Um, and get into more detail later.